Good morning, everybody. And especially to you dads, happy Father's Day. I hope you got plenty of presents, maybe breakfast in bed. I hope you get spoiled today and have a great time with your family. Enjoy this day. Glad you could all join us this morning. Before we start with worship, we have some uh, announcements. The Corona regulations are relaxing somewhat. So we want to encourage you to get together with your life group on Sundays to watch the service together. Just make sure you keep your one and a half meter distance. Now, if you don't have a life group to meet with, we're trying to set up what we call home churches. Basically, that means that someone opens their home for a certain amount of people and others then can go to our website, find the home church close to where they live and sign up for that Sunday. Now, if you would like to host one, let us know. Let us know where you meet. Let us know how many people you can host. And if you are searching for one, check out our website. Then on Monday evening, 29th of June, we will hold our bi-yearly members meeting. This will be an online event this, uh, this spring. If you are a member, you should have gotten an email about this. And if you didn't get it, make sure you let us know so we can send you the link. In July, we're allowed to meet again with 100 people, as long as we keep our distance. So we want to have a picnic together. There will be a program for our children and a program for our youth. It's going to be a great time together. Of course, only 100 people. So sign up on the website and the first 100 people that sign up will get to attend. And then we'll send you the details of where we are meeting uh, and what to bring and all that. So limited spots available. Make sure you sign up quickly. After thinking long and hard, we decided that in the afternoon of July 5th, we will hold a small private baptism ceremony for those that have signed up for baptism. If that's you, you should have gotten an email about this. Now we will film these baptisms and show it later to the whole congregation, but we are worried that we won't be able to organize a baptism with 100 people attending and, and keep our distance, our, our one and a half meter distance. So we decided to do it like this to make sure that we comply with the rules. I know it's less fun, but uh, some of our candidates just couldn't wait to get baptized. Then some news on September 1st, we'll start meeting again on Sunday mornings. Now we assume it will be with a maximum of 100 people. We've made an agreement with the Hermann Wesseling College to start meeting there from September 1st. So no longer in the Amstelveen College, now, we still need to figure out how we are going to do this with 100 people attending, keeping our distance. Is this on invitation or, or is this, uh, are we going to sign up? But we will live stream this on Sunday morning. So keep an eye on our website and on our social media on how we're going to do this. Now, we've also not mentioned it for a while that if you go to our website, below the video of the Sunday service, you can find materials and videos for your kids. For every age, there's materials available. Now, if you have kids, make sure you check this out. Then, some community news. Here are some pictures of the seasonal cooking life group with Jennifer. It looks like they had a lot of fun making some good food under the guidance of Jennifer. Wish I was part of that group. Now, some groups started meeting on Sunday mornings already. Here are some pictures of life groups and home churches that started meeting. Thank you, Manya. Thank you, Oko. Thank you, Vanessa, for sharing these photos with us. Make sure that you send us all pictures of your life group meeting when you start meeting again. It's great to see what's going on in the community. Then, the birthdays that are coming up this week. Congratulations to all those who are having their birthdays. I pray that you will have a blessed year ahead, that the Lord will protect your health and that he be close to you. Thank you all for sending in videos also for the Father's Day. Let's, uh, let's have a look at the compilation that, that we've put together of what you have sent in. Gianna, what makes Papa so special? 
he makes me laugh and he's great at sports. He's also super good at fixing stuff. He can fix almost anything. And he's the best storyteller. I don't think this is important, but my mom says it is. He puts money in the bank. Ivan? Yeah? What makes Papa special? I think he's a superhero. Happy Father's Day, Papa! I love you! Hi, Papa! Thank you for all your hard work. Happy Father's Day! We love you! I love you, Daddy! Happy Father's Day! Oof! <laughs> we love you! We love you! Happy Father's Day to all the dads in Crossroads, especially our dad. We love you. Happy Father's Day. We love you. Yeah. Happy Father's Day. We love you. You're the best dad in the world. You're the best dad in the world. You're the best dad. You're the best dad. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. Cuckoo. Happy, Happy Father's Day. Day. We love you, Daddy. <laughs> Papa, in het hele gekke jaar knuffel ik hem maar een paar. En dan van dat ben jij. En dan maak mijn reuze blij. Lieve papa, in dit hele gekke jaar knuffel ik er maar een paar. En dan van dat ben jij. En dan maak mijn reuze blij. En ik geef ook nog een dikke zoen. Want dat mag wij papa's doen. Ik wens je een fijne vaardag waar je op mij lekker knuffelen mag. Papa, you are my superhero. <laughs> and ours too. Happy Father's Day. We love you. We love you, Dad. You're, You're the, the best. Hallo, lief papa. We wensen je een fijne vaderdag. En we houden heel veel van je. Maak er een leuke dag van en we wensen je God zegen toe. Doei! Happy Father's Day! Pieper de piep! Hoera! Pieper de pieper de piep! Hoera! Papa, Papa is de beste van de hele wereld! Ik word steeds meer op jou! That was fun. Thank you all for sending in your videos. Thank you all for your sustained giving as well. It gives us the opportunity to put the, together these services online, to help people in our community that, that need help and to, to help us to continue to support our missionaries. Now, if you're already giving, thank you. Now, if you want to start giving, check out our website. There's also an option to give via credit card if you live outside of the Netherlands, but if you live inside the Netherlands, you can also scan the QR code that you're seeing right now. Now before we go into worship, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for, for our fathers. Thank you that you are our Father in heaven. Lord, thank you that in the, the good fathers that we've had in our lives, that we could see um, your Father heart reflected. Now, Lord, we also know that some people in our congregation that didn't have a good father, their, their fathers hurt them, or, or they didn't have a father growing up, or they want to be a father, but, but life just didn't turn out that way. Lord, in Psalm 68, you say, you are the father of the fatherless, and we pray that today you will bring comfort and healing to these people that that they may know that you are their Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's worship together. Good morning, Crossroads. Wonderful that we can gather again to, today to worship God. And uh, we're going to do this beautiful song called Glorious, talking about how glorious Jesus is. And uh, in the book of Hebrews, it says in uh, chapter 1, verse 3, 
The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Hallelujah. And he's coming back again soon. Let's praise him. Yes. Hallelujah.
You are glorious, Lord God. We bless you. We thank you, Father. We lift up our voices in praise to you today. Thank you that your mercy is in you every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you, Father.
is my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Ik ben een terrible person. Ik ben echt een verschrikkelijke persoon geweest. Ik heb bullied people. Ik heb mensen gepest. Ik ben having. Ik ben trusting items instead of God. Ik heb meer vertrouwen gehad in dingen dan God. En ik ben een terrible son. Ik ben echt een verschrikkelijke zoon geweest. I wonder if God will accept me. Ik vraag me af of God me zal accepteren. Hey, I heard Billy was outside, you know, the ugly one. You want to tease him? Lelijke Billy is buiten and we couldn't pest No, no, I can't do that. God wouldn't approve of that. Je gaat niet mee, want God zou dat niet toestaan? Nee, no. But what's wrong with you? Remember all the bad things you did? Yeah, things I did. No, no. What's wrong with me? Ew, a sad, boring Christian. <laughs> I'm not sad. Yeah, you are. You didn't even come pick an ugly billy with us. No, you should not even come with us. You really think that your God is going to accept you with all the terrible things you've done in the past? God will not accept me for the things that I have done? No, obviously. <laughs> Hey, what's the matter? What I miss is, is I'm bang that God me not will forgive me and yeah, that He me not will accept me. What? Are you scared that God won't forgive you or won't accept you? Mm -hmm. You know, God sent so many prophets. I mean, Jeremiah is a good example where He sent sent Jeremiah to his to God's people and said, "Hey, if you repent and turn back to me, I will forgive you." Dus God zegt dat als je bekeert en ja, terug gaat naar hem dat hij mij zou vergeven. Ja, yeah, it's that simple. If you repent and turn back to him, he'll forgive you. Wow. Ja, yeah, and that's a promise. Dat is een belofte. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to pray with you? Ja, yeah, sure. Right. Let's find a spot and I'll pray with you. Okay. Good morning, friends. Uh, we continue with our series on Jeremiah, and today I want to read from Jeremiah 3, verses 12 and 13, and Jeremiah 7, verses 5 to 7. Re Return, faithless Israel, says the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt, that you have rebelled against the Lord your God. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly one with another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods um, to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your ancestors forever and ever. Amen. Now, friends, by word count, uh, this, the book of Jeremiah, is the longest book in the entire Bible. And let's be honest, it's not an easy book to read, and uh, this is why I have spent a bit of time the last two weeks giving you a bit of historical and geographical context, and really why I've given you some daily uh, passages to read and some questions to engage with, some material for you to interact with, just to help you in your study of the book of Jeremiah. If you read this book uh, without background knowledge, this book uh, is not going to be easy and you really are going to struggle because it really skips around chronologically and the themes seem to uh, often be very dark and confusing 
And the danger becomes that you and I would then miss the message that it contains for us today. And I really do believe that Jeremiah contains a valuable and necessary message uh, for you and I today. It is as we understand the background and the history of that time that the book comes alive and we discover that God can and wants to use their story to speak into our story. And that is our prayer, that we will hear God speak to us through this sermon series. Now, in the first week, I used a map to give you a bit of understanding into the story. Last week, I used a genealogy. And today, I will use a timeline to further give you insight into the book of Jeremiah. Also, for the last two weeks, I will do the study material a little bit differently. And instead of just only giving you a bunch of, um, a bunch of questions to interact with, I've decided to, yes, give you the questions, but also to give you daily readings for the week and daily material to work on for every day of the week. And my hope is that you will download it and that you will engage with the material and that you'll find them to be uh, a blessing to you. Right, my friends, a quick refresher then as we step into week three. Jeremiah began prophesying when he was around 16 years old in the year 627 BC. And his message is primarily about saying what will happen in the year 587 BC. Remember, these were tumultuous times and the old Assyrian Empire was coming to an end and a new empire was growing. Um, and they were about to conquer the old Assyrian Empire. Of course, I'm talking about the Babylonians and the Babylonian Empire. And we remember from week one that the kingdom of Judah was geographically situated in a politically and economically strategic place, linking together the continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe. And any empire is going to want to control this route because it held so much trade value. And so Jeremiah goes to bed at night and he has this recurring dream from God, this recurring nightmare about the city in which he lives, Jerusalem, being burned to the ground by the Babylonians. That the temple and the city walls will be destroyed, the people killed, and he can see this happening. And what he knows is that if only the people will return to God, because remember they had turned their backs on God, but if they, return, if they were willing to return to God, then God will save them and protect them. God will stop this terrible disaster from happening to them. This was his message for 40 years. And in all that time, Instead of listening, the people ridiculed and continued ignoring this message from God and continued worshipping these false idols from the ancient Near East, turning their backs on God. Now, if you read this book, you get a very strong sense, firstly, of this anguish, this fire burning within Jeremiah's soul. Please, people, listen. Because life without God is terrible and it doesn't end well. Secondly, but the other very strong sense you get is not just of Jeremiah's anguish, but of God's anguish. Why, oh why have you abandoned me? My people, why have you uh, turned your backs on me? Please return to me because I love you so much. Jeremiah knew that God had given his people this piece of land. And that God would protect them, no matter how big or strong their enemies were, how difficult their circumstances were, God would protect them, if only they would return to him. But they didn't want to hear this, and they continued worshipping false idols. A very sad indictment indeed. Last week, I showed you that, Jeremiah, that Jeremiah's ministry took place uh, during the reign of the last five kings of Judah. Uh, do you remember them by any chance? Uh, let's go through them very quickly. Josiah, good king. 
Jehoaz, bad king. Jehoiakim, another bad king. His son Jehoiakim, another bad king. And then lastly, Zedekiah also turns away from God, bad king. Now, most of Jeremiah's ministry happens during the last 10 years of the reign of King Zedekiah. Saying, same message, please return to God. You are praying to and worshipping false gods that don't even exist. They're not real. And when the Babylonians come, they cannot save you. But the people didn't want to listen and continued their worship of primarily these two ancient Near Eastern gods that I've spoken of before. At the time, a reminder, and here's some pictures, some photos again to remind you, Baal and Asherah, giving their hearts and lives, and even the lives of their children, to these false gods, turning their backs on their God. I'm going to put up a timeline now, a timeline for you now, um, and this, and on this timeline, uh, you will see uh, what you'll see now is the last years of the kingdom of Judah. So as I'm speaking, have a look at this timeline that will be on your screen right now. So there you will see um, that in the year 605, the Babylonians controlled Judah. And they demanded that the Israelites pledge allegiance to them and pay an annual tax. And this was the price for their continued safety and freedom. Then you'll see on the timeline in 598 BC, Jehoiakim rebelled against them and refused to pay this tax and joined forces with a number of small little kingdoms to fight against the Babylonians. Well, <laughs> You can imagine what happened. The Babylonian army comes far too strong, surrounds the city of Jerusalem, lays siege to it in 598 BC. And of course, um, Joachim dies and his son Joachim takes over and he surrenders Jerusalem um, inevitably to the Babylonians. So then in 597 BC, they march into Jerusalem. They took all of the treasures out of the temple. They took the king, his mother, and 10,000 citizens and carried them away into exile to Babylon. And this is what's known as the first deportation. The Babylonians then appointed another king, a puppet king really, Zedekiah, one of Josiah's sons actually. And they say, okay, you can rule but you must pledge allegiance to us and you must start paying your tribute tax again. And if you do that, we will leave you alone. Well, so there were a few years of peace, but then in 588 BC, Zedekiah again rebels against the Babylonians. And again, the same thing happens. He hopes uh, that some other surrounding nations will stand with him, for example, the Egyptians, that they will help him fight against the Babylonians but the Babylonian army now arrives with a great vengeance, far too powerful, far too strong. They camp around the city of Jerusalem for 18 months. The city walls managed to keep them safe. Uh, safe. In fact, the Israelites would destroy their own homes inside the city to reinforce the city walls to help protect them. Eventually, they ran out of food. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar breaks down the walls, marches into the city and utterly, utterly destroys it. So in 587 BC, on July the 18th, the kingdom of Judah ceases to exist for 50 years. The king is carried away into exile. Now, in Old Testament history, this is one of the most important dates to know about. Remember this date, 587. Everything in the Old Testament either leads up to this event or is written in response to this event. I'll talk a little bit more about that next week. So let's have a look. Now Jeremiah speaks a great deal about God's vengeance and about the destruction of Jerusalem. And we read that and it, and it can be quite disturbing for us. And we ask, God, why? why? Why is God so angry and portrayed with such violence in this book of Jeremiah? You know, perhaps you have thought about this. 
you understand and can identify with the love of God and, you know, that God is a God of love that we read of in the New Testament, loving and kind. But then you read the Old Testament and sometimes wonder why is God portrayed as violent and vengeful? The wrath of God. I mean, how do we make sense of a God who is angry and vengeful in the Old Testament and a loving and merciful God in the New Testament? And if you read the book of Jeremiah, these are questions that can fill your heart for sure. Well, let me try and answer them very quickly a little bit. I think firstly, we, de we do see God as loving and merciful in the Old Testament. But it is important to understand that when we read the Old Testament, that when uh, the prophets spoke, they spoke in light of the language, images, and metaphors that they had at their disposal and that they understood and could identify with. So, for example, Jeremiah knew that the destruction was coming. He knew people turned away from God, and he knew that God was their only salvation. And he now draws on images that he is familiar with. He uses the context, the practices, the imagery, and the language of the day. We all speak about God using our own language and our own metaphors. I mean, in fact, all language about God is metaphorical, isn't it? And so Jeremiah draws from metaphors that he has. For example, God is like a jilted husband whose wife has had multiple affairs and now she is selling herself as a prostitute. And God's heart is broken and he's angry and he's upset. Or he talks about God as a father whose children have rebelled against him and turned from him again and again and again. And God's had enough. God's disappointed and angry. But also we must remember that in Jeremiah's day, the gods were portrayed as, as, as vicious, as warriors, as powerful, as fighters, strong, seeking justice. Justice was, was important in those days. And if you stepped over the line, there was punishment. That was the way that they understood God in that day. So when he speaks about the Babylonians coming, in his mind, it is clear. God has had enough, and now judgment is coming to Israel. And we must have insight into that mindset and that way of understanding God. Now, most of us don't like a God of justice. You know, we, we want to hear only of mercy. We want a God who is going to forgive and forget we don't want God to demand the punishment that we deserve. Well, until, until somebody else has done something wrong to us. You know, when, when someone else has done something wrong, then we want God to be just and give them what they deserve. But when it comes to what we do wrong, well, we want God's mercy. That's the way, that's the way we work. The truth, my friends, is this, is that both sides of the nature and character of God are important and important for understanding who God is. It is ever, I mean, is it ever appropriate for God to get angry? Is it ever appropriate for you to get angry? <laughs> I would suggest that there are times and places that if you don't get angry, there's something wrong with you. You know, if... For example, uh, your children are hurt by someone else. You should be angry. And you should try to make that situation right. I mean, if your spouse did what Israel had done to God, you should be angry. And you should say, enough. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. Or, or times with our kids, when we know that if, we, if, if they keep on doing this, that they will get hurt. And I have to say, stop, this is enough. I'm, going to, I'm not putting up with this behavior anymore. This must stop. There will be consequences, you know, like you're going to be grounded for the rest of your life. <laughs> but times where... You raise your voice. You know, during those times, what were you thinking? How many times do I have to tell you to not do this anymore? My friends, 
there is a place for God to be angry. But we have to also understand, in trying to understand this book, that Jeremiah is drawing from the metaphor was familiar to him, yes. Um, but we must understand that here is the beauty about us as New Testament believers believing in Jesus Christ. Jesus changed the metaphors. He changed our way of understanding God. See, because Jesus doesn't take away the idea that there is and should be judgment. It is just that Jesus takes the judgment and the wrath and the punishment of God upon himself and ultimately shows us what God is really like. His life, the life of Jesus, shows us that God is a God of justice, but that he suffers and is willing to suffer for you and me. So he is also a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy and love. There is a price to be paid. There are consequences. But I will take those consequences upon myself, God says, and bear it for you. And that changes how you and I get to see and understand God today. Jeremiah speaks about something that is very real and important in our understanding of God. Justice and God's divine wrath. But all of that is ultimately, and here's really the thing we must understand, is ultimately a way of talking about God's mercy. And that is what is so very important to understand when we read the book of Jeremiah and consider his message. What we find in the book of Jeremiah, and we should not miss, is that when Jeremiah talks about the wrath of God coming, ask yourself this question, why is he talking about this for 40 years before it happens? <laughs> Well, because he wants the people to, re to repent, because ultimately God is a God of mercy. To give them opportunity after opportunity, year after year to repent. He's saying God wants to forgive you. He wants you to come back to him. Please, year after year, opportunity after opp opportunity given. Please turn back to God. Every word of judgment in the book of Jeremiah is actually an invitation to return to God, an invitation to mercy. This is highlighted in the passages that I read for us this morning, right at the beginning of the sermon. God says, yes, through Jeremiah, yes, I'm warning you that this is coming. Judgment is coming, but if you turn back to God, he will save you. In Jeremiah 25, uh, it says, Turn now every one of you from your evil ways and wicked doings and you will remain upon the land. Again, in Jeremiah 2, 3 and 4, return, O people, to me and I will save you. And we see, yes, judgment in Jeremiah, but we really see God's heart and his love for his people over and over again. In Jeremiah 6, verse 16, it says, so says the Lord. Stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies and walk in it and there find rest for your souls. Here is what God was saying through Jeremiah. That there are only really just two ways in which to live life. God's path, and it is sometimes harder and more difficult, but yet it is the blessed path, for God walks with you, and you find life and peace for your soul. There is another path, another way, and it's easier, and so many people take this path, and yet it leads to death and brokenness and hurt. Choose the way that leads to life and gives peace to your soul, Jeremiah says. In fact, Jesus says the same thing in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. You'll remember this. He says, there's a broad way that is easy and leads to destruction. And, there is another, and there's a narrow way that leads to life. Choose the narrow way, Jesus says. And then later he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now the word turn that Jeremiah uses here is the Hebrew word shuvah. 
And in Greek, it is metanoia, which in English is to repent. And the idea was this, was that you are walking down a path, and this path leads to pain and destruction. And the call is to turn around from this path, to turn away from that path, and to turn to the right path that leads to life and peace for your soul. My friends, what are some of the paths that people take that leads away from God? For some, it's the struggle with infidelity. And when you go down that path, it leads to lives being destroyed and families destroyed. It doesn't take a prophet to figure that out. It's just the way it works. We know that there are certain paths we take, and these paths take us away from God. And those paths always lead to pain and actually a deep, deep loneliness. What paths have you taken that you need to turn back from? What path are you on right now? Jeremiah reminds us with this relevant message for us today. Choose the ancient path. Choose to follow God. Turn back to him and you will be saved, you will be delivered, you will be healed. My friends, here is the thing that you and I need to hear. For 40 years, he preaches this message. He's put in jail, beaten. He has to go into hiding, but he doesn't stop, he doesn't relent. He keeps going and he preaches this message all the way till June 587 BC. The Babylonians are at the walls knocking it down and still he is saying to them, it's not too late, turn to God. It's not too late. You are not too far gone. There is still hope, even now. At this late stage in the game, God would save you. I mean, look at Jeremiah 38 verse 17. Now, it's about a month before the city is destroyed, and Zedekiah calls for Jeremiah. He was in prison at the time. He calls him to come and speak to him. And then Jeremiah says this to King Zedekiah. It says, this is what the sovereign Lord God Almighty says. If you surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, your life will will be spared and the city will not be burned down you and your family will live after everything that he had done god still says in year 39 month 11 number 99 last minute god still says i will still save you if you turn to me but sadly, Zedekiah chooses to remain stubborn and he does not surrender and he does not turn back to God. Why? Why doesn't he surrender? Pride, arrogance, fear. My friends, it's only in surrender that there is hope. It is only in surrender that I encounter the God of new beginnings. Don't be Zedekiah. Don't allow fear, arrogance, pride to keep you from experiencing the God of forgiveness. Turn to Him. If you want to turn to God, why don't you pray right now and ask God for forgiveness right where you are seated now and turn to Him and ask Him back into your life and to help you to choose the right path, to help you to turn back from these wrong paths that you've, that you've taken in life. And friends, why don't you send me an email at my story at xrds.nl and I'll be in touch with you and I'll, and I'll communicate with you and I'll pray with you and for you. So Zedekiah refuses to surrender and that next month they tore down the city walls to go to the temple to take everything of value. Then they plundered the royal palace. Zedekiah tries to flee to Jericho of course but they captured and taken to Nebuchadnezzar Nezer and made to watch what the Babylonians were going to do to the city. 
and they burned the city to the ground, including the temple of God. Then they started to kill the people. In fact, they brought the king's sons, and this all happens in Jeremiah 39, you can go and read it, and kill his sons. And then they kill all his friends and family and advisors, and then eventually, finally, they gouge out his own eyes and take him away to Babylon. Part of what we learn in the book of Jeremiah here in week three in our series is that sin has consequences. There's just no way around it, my friends. There's just no other way of saying it. Sin has consequences. Taking the wrong path has consequences. Yes, God will let you reject him, mock him, walk your own path. God will not force you to walk in his path. He gives you freedom. But choosing to live far from God has consequences. But the message is really also this. As we ask, what does this have to do with us all these years later? Well, the truths in this book still speak to us today. They are timeless truths. You see, because we struggle with wanting to go our own path, just like those Israelites did. We struggle with letting things other than God take priority in our lives. We still end up chasing after things that we think will give us life, but they just can't deliver. And we also still find ourselves unwilling to say, God, please forgive me. We still struggle with fear, pride, and arrogance. We struggle with repentance, just like these ancient Jews that we read about, you know. We say we're sorry, but then two days later, we do the same thing again. This book reminds us, yes, there are consequences, but it also reminds us that there is always mercy when we repent and return to God. Even at the last minute, when Zedekiah had been unfaithful over and over and over again, God was still waiting to take him back if he would only turn to God. See, my friends, sometimes we think, I'm too far gone. Zedekiah and the book of Jeremiah teaches us that there is no place that you can go that God will not take you back. God's mercy is relentless. That's what I see in the book of Jeremiah. Yes, there are consequences for our actions, but as far as the eternal consequences for our sin goes, Jesus has paid the price. And the book of Jeremiah teaches us that God is relentless in pursuing us, in hoping that we will turn back to Him. God is relentless in His redeeming and transforming of us. Yes, God is grieved by our sin, but the dominant message of Scripture is grace. And I pray that you will hear that today. And see that in the message of Jeremiah. Turn back to me and I will save you, God says. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you for being with us today. If you would like prayer, there's a prayer team waiting for you from 11 to 11.30 online. This is via Zoom. Check out our website on how to log in or you can send us an email and we'll get back to you. But now let's pray the prayer of blessing together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great Sunday.